people that they write news about. You're a statistic. I'm a statistic. <laughs> you haven't made it in the world until you're a CDC statistic. <laughs> Hey guys, it's me Andrea and I have someone who's very special here today, my sister Julia! Hi everyone! When you're traveling and you hear about things that are happening around the globe, you're just like, Psh, that'll never happen to me or anyone that I know. And then my sister got Zika and I realized, wow, that was a really irresponsible way of thinking. She's very uniquely qualified because not only did she get Zika, but she's also a nurse anesthetist and has her doctorate. Wow. To cover my sister's <laughs> she needs to have this disclaimer. I we'll put it thing. here. We don't want to ruin her career with my YouTube videos. Right. <laughs> We're not gonna diagnose anybody here. All right, so tell us, what is Zika? So Zika is primarily a mosquito-borne illness. It can also be considered a sexually transmitted disease because it can be transmitted by blood or bodily fluids. And then there's been one confirmed case in the United States by a needle stick in a lab. Typically, you get Zika from a mosquito. Mm -hmm. You have to be in a place that they have those types of mosquitoes. Very southern United States, Central America, South America. Most people actually don't get sick off of Zika, right. except you, but it's the complications that has people freaked out. So what are those? So the main two complications are Guillain-Barre syndrome and microencephaly. Guillain-Barre syndrome can affect anybody who has the virus. It is a temporary paralysis and it causes weakness throughout all of the muscles in the body. Sometimes people have it not so bad, sometimes people have it really bad, and if it's really bad and it affects the muscles that help you breathe, then Guillain-Barre syndrome can actually be life-threatening. The other main complication is microencephaly. So if a woman has the Zika virus, either while she's trying to get pregnant or while she is pregnant, then she can pass microencephaly onto the fetus, and that can cause severe growth restrictions in the brain and the skull of the fetus. It is considered a sexually transmitted disease, and both females can transmit it to the males, and the males can transmit it to the females. So if either one of them in that couple has the Zika virus, virus, then that fetus could potentially be affected with microencephaly. The female holds the Zika virus in her system for about eight weeks. The man can hold the Zika virus in his system for six months. Oh, no. You can't have any unprotected sex during that time. So if a couple has gone on vacation into a place that has the Zika virus, the couple should wait six months before having unprotected sex or before trying to get pregnant because it can be passed back and forth between the two of them. So now that we got all that good stuff out of the way, what happened? How did you get bit by a Zika mosquito. I was vacationing with a girls trip in the Dominican Republic. We knew ahead of time that the resort had had reported cases of the Zika virus. So we packed extra DEET. None of us were planning on getting pregnant, so we didn't really care so much. And we were like, whatever, what are the chances? When we got there, we were layering our mosquito repellent, our DEET, on top of our sunscreen. And the mosquitoes did not care. They still kept biting us. We tried those wristbands. Still, the mosquitoes did not care. They were landing directly directly on the mosquito repellent bands. On the trip, I didn't feel sick at all. I was there for five days, came home, and about three days after I came home, I started feeling like I was coming down with a cold, I had a headache, I kind of felt feverish. And then somebody asked me if I had been crying, and I asked them why they would say that, and they said that my eyes were all red, and then I looked in the mirror and saw that my eyes were, in fact, very bloodshot. <laughs> By the time I woke up the next morning, I had a rash on my chest and my arms, a high fever, like over 101, still had the headache, had the conjunctivitis, and then my joints were really sore, almost like if you wanted to crack your knuckles or something, but you couldn't. So those are the main symptoms, and I had every single one, so that was my cue to then head to the doctor. I think what a lot of people don't realize is getting diagnosed is kind of a, a thing. It's kind, it's, of, a, it's kind of hard to get diagnosed. It's a process. Initially, when I went to see my doctor, she went through a checklist that was provided by the Illinois Department of Public Health, and if you had more than four symptoms, then they would recommend the blood test. So she had to report my case and my symptoms along with all sorts of things about my travel to the Illinois Department of Public Health and to the CDC. Then the state health department is the one that approves the test. So it is a blood test and a urine test. It took three days to get approval from Illinois Department of Public Health and the window of testing positive on these blood and urine tests is quite small. So by the time you get home and then you see your doctor and then you wait a couple days for approval and then you actually go in to get the test, you might be outside that window. What? It's a very expensive test so they want to make sure that they're not Yes, and that's why they, they have a checklist so that they're not just doing the blood and the urine test on just anybody. For example, the two other girls that were traveling with me, they had minor symptoms, headaches, and a little bit of a fever. Neither one of them got tested. One of them went to her doctor uh -huh. but didn't get approved for the test. The other one never went to her doctor. And if you had four or more symptoms, then you were approved for the blood and the urine test. So since I had every single symptom, <laughs> I was approved for the test, and that's why they did the blood and the urine test on me. They also did 
four pregnancy tests. Oh, uh, wow. Yes. What was your test result? So my blood test came back negative, but my urine test came back positive. Oh, no. So then I went from being a suspected case to a confirmed case. Confirmed. You're one of the people that they write news about. Yeah, I think I was <laughs> number- You're a statistic. I'm a statistic. <laughs> so yay, you're not pregnant, but you do have Zika. <laughs> Life is all about balance, you know? <laughs> now what? Now how do they treat it now that they know? So there's no cure for the Zika virus. What? It's just treating the symptoms to try to make you feel better. Taking ibuprofen, Tylenol, drinking lots of fluids, things that you would typically do if you were sick with a really bad cold or something like that. Typically the symptoms last five to seven days. My rash and the red eyes went away after like three to four days. The initial symptoms went away, but then you had these lingering symptoms. Yes, so I had weakness after having the Zika virus for almost a month. Because of those concerns of and Barre syndrome, I was a bit more nervous about some of that. First symptom that I noticed of my weakness was leg weakness. I was tripping a lot and kind of dragging my feet and stubbing my toes. I tried to pick up my laptop with one hand and I ended up dropping my laptop and cracking the screen. Driving was sometimes a challenge. You never really think about holding onto a steering wheel, like it's a hard thing, because it's not. But when you're weak, holding onto the steering wheel is a bit challenging. I had an appointment with a neurologist to try to get more officially diagnosed. And at the time that my neurologist appointment was scheduled. A couple days before that, the weakness started going away. So like a really bad patient that I am, I canceled my appointment. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, right? <laughs> <laughs> we need to insert an asterisk here. Yeah. <laughs> because there's a little bit of a caveat to my whole story. Just prior to going on this vacation, I had a really bad sinus infection and I was on two weeks worth of antibiotics and steroids just before going down to the Dominican Republic. So it's quite possible that I was slightly immunocompromised when I went on vacation because of the steroids that I was taking. So the fact that I was was in the minority of people who actually have symptoms and the fact that I had all of those symptoms might have been because I was being treated with steroids just before going on this vacation. So that means you're really strong. Well, unfortunately, my immune system was not strong. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you're healthy and now that you're officially a statistic, Yay! <laughs> <laughs> what have you learned? Has it kind of changed your idea of anything? Usually when you travel, you kind of look at where are you going? What kind of things do I need to look out for? Are there pickpocketers in certain places? Could I get malaria? All those sorts of things. We knew ahead of time that Zika was a concern, but we took a calculated risk. And in the grand scheme of things, being under the weather for a month was not great, but was certainly not the worst thing that could happen. In our case, we just wanted to have fun. We had this girl's trip planned. None of us were planning on getting pregnant, so we took that risk. If you're a couple that's thinking about honeymoon, and starting a family in a Zika zone, maybe you want to rethink that. But if you just want to have fun, then you know, you only live once. So no regrets. No regrets. Thank you all so much for watching and for listening to my crazy tale and for looking at all of my really glamorous pictures. Make sure to subscribe and if you want to follow her and all of her mosquito-borne illnesses on Snapchat. Gooey There we go. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. Safe travels.